You may be in our area or far away, and you're welcome wherever you are. In this video, wherever Joseph is, there's something very special about him. You will find him trafficked, sexually harassed, falsely accused, and imprisoned without trial. And yet, God is with him, even in the most grim blow. There's something special with Joseph. Through Jeremiah, God says, I know the plans I have for you, a future full of hope. So welcome to worship. This we believe, that in a world where there are kings and queens and presidents and governments and special advisors, you ultimately are the king. Lord, this we believe, that in a world where there are parents and teachers and role models and celebrities, you above all are father to us. Lord, this we believe that in a world where there are so many people offering to help, so many people who make things difficult, where there are so many people making demands on us and asking help from us, where there are so many people, you are our helper and our strength. Lord, this we believe, that in a world that has power to destroy itself, in a world where there's enough food but not enough concern, enough fuel but not enough self-discipline, enough knowledge but not enough love, you are the one who can give meaning to our lives and purpose and a future for all humankind. Each one of us is known to you. What we've done and what we should do and what we could be Forgive the many things we have done wrong. Help us to live as your children, to know Jesus Christ and to follow all the way. And together we pray as Jesus taught us the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Genesis chapter 39 Now Joseph was taken down to Egypt and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had brought him down there. The Lord is with Joseph, and he became a successful man. 
He was in the house of his Egyptian master. His master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord caused that all he did to prosper in his hands. So Joseph found favour in his sight and attended him. He made him overseer of his house and put him in charge of all that he had. From the time that he made him overseer in his house and over all that he had, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. The blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in house and field. So he left all that he had in Joseph's charge. And with him there, he had no concern for anything but the food that he ate. Now Joseph was handsome and good looking. And after a time, his master's wife cast her eyes on Joseph and said, lie with me. But he refused and said to his master's wife, look, with me here, my master has no concern about anything in the house. And he has put everything that he has in my hand. He is not greater in this house than I am. Nor has he kept back anything from me except yourself, because you are his wife. How then could I do this wickedness and sin against God? And although she spoke to Joseph day after day, he would not consent to lie beside her or to be with her. One day, however, when he went into the house to do his work, and while no one else was in the house, she caught hold of his garment, saying, Lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand and fled and ran outside. When she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and had fled outside, she called out to the members of her household and said to them, See, my husband has brought amongst us a Hebrew to insult us. He came into me to lie with me, and I cried out with a loud voice, and when he heard me raise my voice and cry out, he left his garment beside me and fled outside. Then she kept his garment by her until his master came home and she told him the same story, saying, The Hebrew servant whom you have brought amongst us came into me to insult me. But as soon as I raised my voice and cried out, he left his garment beside me and fled outside. When his master heard the words that his wife spoke to him, saying, This is the way your servant treated me, he became enraged. And Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. He remained there in the prison. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love. He gave him favour in the sight of the chief jailer. The chief jailer committed to Joseph's care all the prisoners who were in the prison, and whatever was done there, he was the one who did it. The chief jailer paid no heed to anything that was in Joseph's care, because the Lord was with him, and whatever he did, the Lord made it prosper. Joseph is now a slave. Even though you may know the end of the story, don't take the happy end for granted. To be a slave is the end of a person. A slave is a thing, possibly worse than any animal. A slave is a possession. Slaves are only cared for to get the money's worth out of them. So that slaves do not rebel or do not run away. Their punishment can be gross and excessive, setting an example so none of the slaves even dare to try. The will to resist and life is beaten out of slaves. Their will is broken by brutality. As a slave, Joseph is lucky. He gets traded as a high-value slave, so his body is not harmed or mutilated. He may be traded like cattle, but he is lucky with his new owner. But remember, he's a slave. He's fully at the mercy of whoever takes possession of him. Slavery is still done today. Human trafficking is still alive. And it works just as with Joseph. Exemplary punishment puts fear into the enslaved, not to dare anything. Trafficked people are taken out of their depth, out of the land they know, into a strange language where they have no words, no relationships, no friends, to a place where they do not know how things work. They don't know who to call for help, plus they are frightened stuff. Human trafficking. Slavery are dehumanizing. Slavery is the place Joseph is in now, even though he is reasonably lucky. There is something curious in the text. The Lord was with Joseph and he became a successful man. 
This is the first mention of God in the story. Here at the lowest point. Maybe they had not managed to beat God out of Joseph. Maybe here in the depth of humiliation and abuse here, the dreamer of power remembered God. And still, his gift of good leadership can emerge and be noticed. And so Joseph is entrusted with a lot. The Lord was with him. And he was successful. Please don't ever turn that logic around. Never think if someone is successful, the Lord must be with them. What about the owner of many slaves then? Is their wealth a sign of blessing? Never. The Lord was with Joseph. God is with the downtrodden. Their faith is the only thing they can cling onto. And so Joseph can still be Joseph and display the gift of his life and be given a chance to succeed. Slave owner Potiphar, captain of the guard, entrusts almost everything to Joseph and yet Joseph is still a slave. Potiphar's wife has no name. When you look ahead in the story, you learn that sometimes the pharaoh gives to his chief officers a wife. She comes with a job. Maybe that's how Potiphar acquired his wife. If that is the case, she has little say in who she is with. She has little power and she has no name in the story. But still... The difference is that Joseph is a slave in a vulnerable position to anyone in charge. The wife's craving for Joseph is the meeting of one with little power and a slave. Both are at the mercy of Potiphar, the chief of the guard. Here in this vulnerable low place, God comes in a second time when Joseph replies to her craving, How then could I do this great wickedness and sin against God? That is not about sex, but the abuse of trust that Joseph speaks up against. Almost everything has been entrusted to him and he refuses to break that trust. In this Egyptian world, when everyone else operates on power and position, Joseph, in contrast, thinks in terms of trust, against the abuse of trust. And that, quite likely, is his recipe for success. Reliability, honesty, trustworthiness. And he's not abandoning it for a fleeting joy. But Joseph still is a slave. And when the nameless wife realizes Joseph's inner strength, she realizes her own powerlessness and feels the need to rescue her own survival. To save her compromised self, she turns against the slave Joseph. And Potiphar, the slave owner, betrayed by his wife, takes her word for what happened. There's no listening to a slave's version of events, no listening to a Hebrew. Of course it is the slave who gets dumped in prison. That swiftly settles the situation for everyone. And Joseph is now in an even worse situation. Betrayed by family, sold and made a slave, trafficked into a strange land and, in addition, now declared a sex offender and put in prison. Is there a lower place on earth? Except the Lord was with him. Still Joseph clings on to not breaking trust. He is reliable and trustworthy. The Lord was with Joseph.
the next I cry to God, oh, listen, Lord, to me. Oh, hear my voice in this distress, this fire of misery. I pray for God with all my heart, my hope is in His word. I'm both a watchman for the dawn, I'm longing for from Genesis chapter 40. Sometime later, the king of Egypt's wine steward and his chief baker offended the king. He was angry with these two officials and put them in prison in the house of the captain of the guard, in the same place where Joseph was being kept. They spent a long time in prison and the captain assigned Joseph as their servant. One night, there in prison, the wine steward and the chief baker each had a dream, and the dreams had different meanings. When Joseph came to them in the morning, he saw that they were upset. He asked, Why do you look so worried today? They answered, Each of us had a dream, and there is no one here to explain what the dream means. It is God who gives the ability to interpret dreams, Joseph said. Tell me your dreams. So the wine steward said, In my dream there was a grapevine in front of me with three branches on it. As soon as the leaves came out, the blossoms appeared and the grapes ripened. I was holding the king's cup, so I took the grapes and squeezed them into the cup and gave it to him. Joseph said, This is what it means, the three branches are three days. In three days the king will release you, pardon you and restore you to your position. You will give him his cup as you did before when you were his wine steward. But please remember me when everything is going well for you and be, please be kind enough to mention me to the king and help me to get out of this prison. After all, I was kidnapped from the land of the Hebrews and even here in Egypt, I didn't do anything to deserve being put in prison. When the chief baker saw that the interpretation of the wine steward's dream was favourable, he said to Joseph, I had a dream too. I was carrying three bread baskets on my head. In the top basket, there were all kind of pastries for the king and the birds were eating them. Joseph answered, this is what it means. The three baskets are three days. In three days, the king will release you and have your head cut off. Then he will hang your body on a pole and the birds will eat your flesh. On his birthday, three days later, the king gave a banquet for all his officials. He released his wine steward and his chief baker and brought them before his officials. He restored the wine steward to his former position, but he executed the chief baker. It all happened just as Joseph had said. But the wine steward never gave Joseph another thought. He forgot all about him. Joseph, the trafficked slave convicted sex offender and prisoner, somehow is incredibly lucky once more. The chief jailer notices something special about Joseph. The chief jailer entrusts almost everything into Joseph's care and Joseph proves trustworthy and reliable. The Lord was with him. What a dog-eat-dog -dog world it is. Two high-ranking, competent people, the cupbearer and the chief baker, have offended the king pharaoh. The punishment is jail. So the jail in the captain of the guard's house is quite a VIP jail. Not just any jail. It's where the king pharaoh's personal prisoners are put until the King Pharaoh's mood towards them changes in one direction or another. There are no court cases, no justice, just the whim of power. Joseph, in contrast, maintains trustworthiness and reliability. It makes Joseph stand out, even in this low place. 
Joseph also notices one morning how two of his prisoners are unusually troubled. Both of them, it turns out, had a dream in the same night, and there's no one to interpret them. In this very low place, God comes into the story a fourth time. When Joseph says, do not interpretations belong to God? When before to Joseph the breaking of trust was a sin against God, here the delicate, intimately personal matter of dreams, like trust, belongs to God. Trust and dreams are a matter of the soul. Trust and dreams protect the fabric of life. To Joseph, they're holy. The wholeness of life hangs on trust and dreams. Do not interpretations of dreams belong to God? They do. As in this dog-eat-dog society, people cannot trust each other, cannot be close to each other. There is not necessary trust to share and, and interpret dreams. Slaves have dreams beaten out of them. Subjects of a powerful king must not dare to dream beyond their station or to interpret. But Joseph, in this very lowest point, is close to God. This makes him free in some way. It makes him different. And so he says, please tell your dreams to me. The dreams described, especially the baker's dream, feels like an Alfred Hitchcock inspiration to me. <laughs> and Joseph gets it right. His interpretation, gifted by God, is spot on. However, the society Joseph is still in is one of power and self-preservation. There's only seeing to your own survival. And so when the cupbearer is restored to serve the pharaoh once more, the slave captive in present Joseph is conveniently forgotten. He has done what he was useful for and has duly dropped. Power is still brutally executed. For the lucky, this means life. For the unlucky, this means death. And the mood of the pharaoh could change any moment again. Caught up in it is Joseph forgotten in jail. Isn't it interesting that it is here at the low point that we hear more about God than at any point before in this story. Joseph, the trafficked slave and prisoner, has lost everything in life. Lost his father's love, his family, of his homeland and language. Here Joseph could resign and just give up his life. And yet, here it seems his dreams of greatness are cleansed by humiliation and turned into humble leadership. In this lowest time, he discovers God as the deepest source of trust. It gives him resilience. His leaning on God makes him survive in this cutthroat world. And where can it go from here for Joseph? Have you, at some low point in life, known God? Or found God a strength to you? We pray together. God of life and love, we turn to you with our prayers for the world. You care for the world so deeply that you willingly gave your all for it, living and dying among us through your Son, Jesus Christ. Reach out again in mercy and heal our wounds. We bring you the causes of so much suffering, the arrogance that assumes privilege and power as a right, the greed that denies many their share of the earth's riches, the waste 
that wantonly squanders the resources you have given, the intolerance that divides families, communities and nations, the indifference that lacks care for you or anything. Reach out again in mercy and heal our wounds. We pray for those who pay the price of human folly, the poor and the hungry, the homeless, the dispossessed and abused, victims of war and violence, crime and cruelty, the distressed, isolated, crushed and forgotten, all who are deprived of love and denied hope, reach out again in mercy and heal our wounds. We pray for those who mourn and who struggle with life, with death, with meaning, those who are sick or in need. In the quiet, we bring before you those we know. Reach out again in mercy and heal our wounds. Lord, in your love, hear our prayers. Come again to the world and bring in your kingdom for the sake of Christ our brother. Amen.
The second reading this week ended with the words, But the wine steward never gave Joseph another thought. He forgot all about him. And so we read that Joseph languished in jail for two whole years before anything more happened. Mark and I are taking a break, not for two years, but for a couple of weeks. And there will be other services you're pointed to in place of this regular one. And we'll be back in a couple of weeks to continue and pick up the Joseph story and where things go next. But first, Joseph's in jail for two whole years beyond this. You go in peace to love and serve the Lord where you are. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you now and always. Amen. <laughs>